so much fun stuff. I'm not sure where to start. Hey, it's Kara. Welcome to my take at the lake. So here we are. It's time. It's time. Finally, I've been chomping at the bit to do this one. We're going to talk about this new, to me, Cotman watercolor field travel set that differs from my field kit. I'll show you the differences. We're going to try out my brushes. This was not in the first video. I finally have some metallic watercolors. I can't wait to start throwing those around. And two watercolor pads that we're going to give a try to. If you watched an earlier video where I did some try me's, I said I had ordered a new watercolor book and this is it, Watercolor for the Soul by Sharon Sharon. Char one Stevens. Gotta love how you spell your name. It's different, right? It could be all of the above. Char one Sharon. Sharon. Who knows? Anyway, I digress. Looks like a beautiful book to me. I should I should watch her video. I'm sure she has one on it, right? She's a watercolorist. Maybe I'll hear her say her name and know from here on out. Because it's not always how it's spelled doesn't always sound like it's spelled. Shout out to Leanne. Name your kids right. LOL. I have an entire library of watercolor books that I've gotten over the years and I love most of them. If I didn't love them, I got rid of them, donated them, gave them away, whatever. But I kept the ones that I really, really liked and I have a lot that I really, really like. If you're interested in knowing more about my watercolor book collection and my favorites, let me know in the comments below and I'd be happy to share those with you too. But why, if you have an entire library full, of course, anyone who's a book lover knows that you can never have too many books, period. But why another watercolor book? Because really, there's only so much that you can read about technique and whatnot. And everybody's style is about, you know, everybody's style is a little different, but everyone's technique is about the same. They suggest good brushes and these colors and this paint and this kind of brush. You know, it's all after the while pretty much the same. So why get another one? Well, I haven't painted regularly in a very long time and I'm anxious to get back to that. I want to ease back into it. I don't want to just start painting big paintings again. I want I want to take it easy and I want to enjoy the process and I, I want to have fun with it. And so I went down to my collection and, and pulled out my favorites and I flipped through them and I've gone through them over and over and over again. And so they all, even though I love them, they all kind of feel like, mm, been there, done that. Because I'm one of those people who goes through and does the trials, does the experiments. I'm one of those people who does the brushwork. And I, I, I treat these books that I pay decent money for like workshops with their author. I, I read most people skip the paper brushes paint and other supplies choosing your palette blah 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 they go i i just want to paint i just i just want to paint i want to paint jellyfish and they go right back to the exercises and skip all of this wonderful work in the beginning now again i've read all of them there's not that much here it's not that much it's not terribly taxing but she might have a technique that I've not heard of. She may have a different spin on an old idea that I've not heard of. And the refreshers always help. So what I, when I say mm, been there, done that with my books, I've done the experiments. I've done the projects. I've, I've done the homework if there's any in the back. You know, they say suggested reading or, or they have a list of things that you can try or whatever. I go ahead and I do that. And I've done them. And I saw this one on Amazon. Like I said, I don't know who this person is. I've never heard of her. Of course, the universe is paying attention. My reticular activating system is on high alert. 
and some other people ordered this book and they've shown it on YouTube. So it just kept showing up and showing up and showing up to me. And I try to pay attention to that kind of stuff. It just spoke to me. The exercises, uh, birch trees, super easy, super fun. Um, purple feathers, who wouldn't love that? There's a stack of rocks in here somewhere that just appeals to me. <laughs> very zen and pretty and fairly simple. This is the kind of watercolor that I want to do for a little while until my muscle memory is back, until I, I, I got a handle on my tools again, until I, I figure it all back out again. And so because it kept coming up and because I loved everything I saw about it, I thought, well, that's the one I want because, of course, there are thousands of them out there. This is another thing that I really, really liked. These are so simple, just simple little shapes. Let it dry. Go over it with the same colors in different places. Put a bookmark in it and call her good. So simple. Anyone can do this. And when you're doing these exercises, the reason I'm encouraging anyone who's new to watercolor, no matter what book you have, do these little things. Because what these things teach you is how your brushes work. What's the water to paint ratio? When someone's talking about creamy consistency versus liquid consistency or inky or dry, or what does that mean exactly? Because we could say it to our blue in the face, but until you've done it, it won't make much sense to you. And so doing these stupid little exercises helps train your brain and your hand to work together, helps you to understand which brush holds the most water. Is is this brush a better, does it come to a better point or does this brush come to a better point? You get to know your tools. I have to say, I don't even know if you can see this, but this is so lopsided. On one side, it's all crooked right there. It kind of goes to an angle. It's supposed to be pointed like that. But there's a tooth in watercolor, and it's kind of rough. And I use primarily synthetic brushes. And so after a while, it's just like a, like a fingernail file. You know, there's a little bit of tooth, a little bit of grit. And so I have had this brush forever. And you can tell it's well worn that it still comes to a decent point when it's wet. That's why I still have it. Plus, it's one of my favorite brushes. Still comes to a nice good point, a nice decent point there at the end. Uh, when it's wet, you can't really tell that I've worn one edge away. Um, just like if you have polish on your nails and you type a lot, the polish wears off on certain corners. It's the same principle. Your brushes will wear out. Well, you have to know which brush works, what papers do you like better than others, etc. And all of those things, when you get back to the fun stuff, you won't have to think about kind of like when you learn how to drive, when you're first learning how to drive, you gotta, you have to think about where's the brake pedal. You have to think about which way to the blinker up for left, down for left. And which way am I going? You have to think about all of those things. 20 years later, after you're driving a long time, you're just driving, right? All that stuff is automatic because you've done it and done it and done it and that's what these things do for your ability so don't skip these parts whatever book you have just do do them you will get to the fun stuff and this will be way more fun if you've mastered these little things i promise i promise now, every, every book will have materials in it, what kind of paper they suggest, and explains the different kind of tooth and format, etc., whether it's block, loose, full sheets, etc., the different kinds of brushes. There are more brushes than I can count. Types of brushes, rounds, flats, cat tongue, yeah. hake, yeah. mops, yeah. sky washes, flats, angle brush, fan brushes, I mean good God, liners, riggers, scrubbers, I could go on, but you get the point. Every person who writes one of these books has their favorite. Like, I don't have very many brushes.
this is almost all of my watercolor brushes. Almost. I have a few here and there tucked away, so I don't have very many. But this one, when it's wet, comes to an extreme point. When it's good and wet, this is the one you use. This is called a sky wash, two inch sky wash. This is the one you use to get your paper wet really fast. Now, I don't know what it was up against, but whatever it was rusted and, and rusted onto my bristles, but that's okay. But what I want you to see here is how thin this is. Now, this looks like an ordinary house brush. Why would you pay almost $50 for this one? I can go to Walmart paint section and get one for $2. Well, here, right here, this supreme edge, this super fine edge, a $2 Walmart brush will not do that. A $2 Walmart brush will leave bristles on your watercolor paper. It won't do what this does, even though side by side, they look about the same. <laughs> you know, a Lamborghini and a Chevette are both cars. You learn all those things. You learn about your tools and whatnot. So your, your people will tell you all their favorites. You'll find your own, but you have to have somewhere to start. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to playing with this book. Again, Watercolor for the Soul, Simple Painting Projects for Beginners to Calm, Soothe, and Inspire. The whole point is not to get you frustrated. And I just put out a short not too long ago about people will say this, and you'll hear it every time I talk about watercolor. People will say, well, I would just use the crappy stuff, the cheap stuff, until I get good. You'll never get there. I promise you will give up in sheer frustration because what you see won't be what you're getting. But it's all watercolor. Yeah, but one is filled with filler and junk and very little pigment. And the other is meant for adults. Kids toy, adults. This is a student grade. This is still a thousand percent better than this. You can get something similar to this. While we're talking about this, I would just like to say, I've seen a lot of people saying, oh, you can do watercolor. You don't have to have fancy equipment. You can just do this. They've been painting for a very long time. And if you watch closely, you have to know what to look for. But a lot of them, when they're, when they're showing off with this, they're doing brushwork that mimics what good watercolor will do on its own. It's tricky and it's slippery. And they, I don't even think they notice it. But if you know someone who sings really, really well, they can sing anything, right? They can use their voice for anything. Same thing with painters. If they've been painting a really long time, they can make this work. But it's, it's not fair because people who are brand new to painting won't notice the brushwork, won't notice the tricks that are behind the scenes that are making this work. They just think that, oh, I just can't do it. I'm just not cut out for watercolor. Oh, I just can't do it. It's stupid. I hate watercolor. I just can't control it. Blah, 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 blah. That's another thing these exercises will help you do is learn to control it. Yes, you can control it. People get photorealism with watercolor all the time because they've learned to control it. But learning all those things through these simple exercises will help you be a better watercolorist and I'm telling you straight up people who are making this work they're not beginners I'll just leave it at that they're not beginners and so telling a beginner that oh yeah you can do you can do wonderful mountains and beautiful flowers with this they're full of shit full of crap anyway on to something else one of the things i'm thinking about maybe i don't know let me know in the comments below is working through this on camera you know like starting at the beginning like i always do i'll read it and then when it comes time to to uh paint something we're still not painting yet you know testing these things out and doing the brushwork and the shades and the mixing of values we can do it on camera together, question mark. I don't know, just a thought. I might hate that, might not happen. Starry colors, I think I should start with this because I'll get all wound up in these other things and forget because that's how I work sometimes. This is the Kiritake Starry Colors. I've seen a lot of people use these. They just add so much to watercolor paintings. I've, I've added metallic ink 
work, pen work, to my watercolors in the past. But I've never had metallic watercolor. And these are a decent size. On the uh, reviews, I've heard people complain that they're not full pans, but they're huge. You know, they're... I think that's even bigger than a... Because a half pan... Yeah, that's even bigger than a full pan. I don't know what these are called. But they're a decent size. And look, I've just jacked them all up. So even though they're not overfilled, they're decent size. You know, and if it's pretty good watercolor. And I've seen people use them a lot and still have quite a bit. So it seems to me that they go quite a ways. So let's play with those just a little bit. And I have another piece. It's not watercolor paper, but it's black. I want to see how that works. And I've been just jazzed. I hope, hope, hope these are good brushes because they're not cheap and i hope they behave like decent brushes these are the travel oh i've thrown my box away they came in so i don't remember the name a cat academy princeton princeton brushes are they on here oh they are look at there princeton aqua elite travel so you can put them all in their little and they're little cubbies, and when they're in their cases, you can just throw this in. I don't know if you remember, or maybe you're new enough that you haven't seen this. This is one of my favorite things in the whole wide world. This is my little watercolor lap book that I made from two old books that were approximately the same size. Painted them, covered the inside, A nice little watercolor box fits right in there. I made gusseted pockets so that I'd have room to stick stuff. There's places here. These are squirt. They're just filled with water. My drawing pencil. This has a pocket for paper. I made pockets for salt because I use salt to make all different kinds of effects when I play with watercolor. I don't know that I've ever done a watercolor that I didn't use salt on. It's a it's a bit of a habit. This is my field. Windsor & Newton Field Kit, which I said differs from this. I will show you the differences here in just a minute. This is one of my favorite things ever. And I put the pretty silver corner protectors on just because I like it. So I have one, and I love this. I've, I've had this since I think I got it, 1994. So you do the math. Long time I've had this husband and I used to travel all the, all the time. We were in the air flying all the time and I used to have really bad anxiety and depression and now I know. That's a story for Positively Creative You, one of the other channels that I'm working on. But in order to keep myself from losing my mind, I would take that little watercolor block that I just showed you and this kit, which has a travel watercolor brush all its own, a little teeny bugger. This holds water. This is your water holder. Let me flip it over for a second. This has a thumb ring, which I love. Put You just hold it, put your thumb through it, and hold it. This fits on there. So you, you pour your water, glug, 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 glug in there put it back and you have lots of mixing space I also so I carried that little kit and one of those little misters a little bit bigger than that um, but those little misters that I got those are for hand sanitizer I got them an Amazon 12 pack for I don't know five bucks or something like that and I filled them with water and just spritz you know you got to these are pan watercolors, so they're dry all the time. You gotta spritz them to reactivate them. Let them set a little bit, get yourself all set up, order a cocktail from the fine stewardess, and then get to painting. I also would throw this in my bike, the little gunny sack on the back of my bike or my backpack. I could take this anywhere. I've had this forever, it's one of my favorite things. I'm so proud of myself that I still have the little brush that comes with. I also carried extra brushes. This is way too tiny, even for that little, I like to work a little with a little bit bigger brush. 
And so I would take some of my other brushes with me, perhaps a liner and or a rigger, certainly a toothbrush and a decent sized flat brush because for that tiny little four by six block, I don't need a two inch sky wash brush to wet that. I don't, I don't need something like this for that tiny little watercolor block. And so just a, a decent sized flat to get a lot of water over couple different brushes to play with this for detail work because it is a decent little brush not great but not horrible either and then you know travel on the go and in my lap book I have plenty of places to uh, when the field kit is in here I have plenty of places to put some brushes in there as well so I had this one why do I need another one well I don't truth be told no one needs two of these however one thing I am huge 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 on and I cannot 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 believe how many people who teach watercolor use only one jug of water that drives me absolutely insane because Let's say we're going to use up some yellow and we're going to, we're going to paint some yellow. Oh wait, I don't want that yellow. I wanted this yellow. So they paint, paint, paint their yellow. They're on that nice, bright, pretty, and then they wash that off. I should have did this the other way around because people do this all the time. Okay, now I want to use purple. So this, this wad, this yellow and purple are complements so that little bit of yellow is going to gray out my purple it might be imperceivable at first but the more the dirtier your water the more muddy your color makes no sense to me so now i'm going to do that i'm going to get this i'm going to just get this nice and dirty with all these different colors just dirty 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 now i've got this muddy dirty water and i'm going to go back into my bright pretty yellow and come over here and go why is my why is my yellow? Why do my colors don't have, how come my colors don't have life? How come they're dull? How come they're muddy? Oh, for the love of all that's holy. Have two, two water jugs. One for dirty, clean it, clean it, clean it, wipe it off. And one clean water to go on to your when you're, when you're wetting your background to throw in a beautiful sky, you want clean water. You don't want this junk. And I know for a fact, ain't nobody getting up and changing that water every five minutes. They're using this to throw in their background. They're using this to wet their clean, bright paper. I don't get it. I'll never understand it. That's why I wanted this bugger. We'll get there. We always get there. She takes these birds walk, bird walks, but there's always a point. I promise there's always a point. So you get this wonderful Cotman watercolor little poster. Cotman watercolor key code. It tells you what they are. It tells you there's a, a code on here, whether it's staining, whether it's permanent, or not permanent, whether it's granulating, whether it's transparent, whether it's opaque. That's all important. If you really want to do watercolor well, you need to know which ones are going to stain so that you can lift colors out. You need to know which ones are going to disappear. My favorite color is Holbein Opera. One of my favorite watercolor colors is Holbein Opera. And it's one of the most fugitive colors there is, meaning in 50 years, you won't even know there was pink there. <laughs> it just dissipates. It just, the sun fades it, UV light fades it. You know, it just, it's a fugitive, meaning it disappears. Staining, you can do whatever you want. You could bleach it and you're not going to get that stain out. You have to know which is which on your palette. These are all good things to know. So if you can get one of these, that will help you understand your colors fine and dandy when every place that makes Windsor Newton Holbein they all have these that you can buy 
and the information is correct, but it won't mean much to you until you see it in action and how it works. Plus, the color here and the color on your watercolor paper is going to be very different, you know, because this is manufactured and it's printed and it's on glossy paper and it's not watercolor paper and it's it's as close as it can be but it's not spot on so that's why i wanted this one because this one has two water gels one two your little flask fill your little flask with water And these have little hooks right here, and they hook right in here. This, oddly enough, does not have a thumb hole on the bottom like the field kit does. I really like the, the thumb hole. However, if you don't put, well even if you do, it's just going to lay there. So I would fill my little water things and then set that aside. And you have this thumb hole, which works just as well. You also have a lot of mixing space. You have mixing wells here. You have these four. This. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten if you want to be messy. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 places to mix paint if you want and two one for clean one for dirty water wells i think that's brilliant i love it this this one also comes with a little travel brush that just lives down in there this one's a little bit bigger than this one i haven't tried it yet but it is a cotton little number five brilliant that's a decent size paintbrush to play with. One of the other reasons I really like this kit uh, is because it's by Windsor & Newton, which is good stuff. It has a warm and a cool yellow. A warm and a cool red. A warm and a cool blue. A warm and a cool green. That is everything you need to make decent watercolor choices to get decent watercolor results. It also has an orange, a brown, a black, and a white. Now the white, in my humble opinion, in watercolor is useless. You're using transparent, sort of, it's kind of chalky, the watercolor white, it's Chinese white, which is usually kind of milky, kind of chalky, so it's sort of opaque in transparent watercolor it muddies things up it doesn't cover like you know i like a chinese white a bleed excuse me a bleed proof white or an acrylic white we could do an entire workshop just on whites in watercolor but i would pop this out and um fill that pan with probably opera that's probably what I would do. I don't use black. I mix my own black. So I would probably pop black and white out and put opera and a, a dioxanine purple. <laughs> Just because I love them. These are pans. This is the dio dioxanine purple that I just love. I popped out the white and filled that right, right away. Uh, the rest of these are the original pans. Well, uh, French Ultra. I go through French Ultra like I do salt. So I use that a lot. I'm sure I've refilled this purple over and over and over again. But the rest of these, the warm and cool yellow, the warm and cool red, the warm and cool green, the burnt, uh, burnt, burnt umber, burnt sienna, and yellow ochre, those are all original. And I've had this thing for years. And I use it quite a bit. Uh, so so they last and last and last. Right now, well, last I checked, just recently, this was on sale for $19. I remember paying almost 50 bucks for this when it first came out. And man, I thought, should I get it? Should I get it? And I thought, yeah, I need it. I absolutely need it. And I've never looked back. But it was pricey. Now it's under, it's under $20 
in its good student grade cotton paint. This one's not too bad. Last I checked, it was 40% off. So this was about $30 um, with that sale. If you're new to watercolor and you're just, if you don't, you want to start watercoloring and you don't know where to start, get one of these two sets because again, you have exactly the color range you need that you can make any color under the rainbow. And two watercolor holes, lots of mixing space. This will set up on a small work area beautifully. Like I said, I used, well, with this one, I, I would set it up on the airplane, you know, that little tray that folds down. I would set this up on the, on the airplane. I would always ask the stewardess for a glass of, a small glass of water. So I would have two water wells. So it can, it can be desktop and it can be take along with you too. It serves double duty, anything that can serve double duty. And it's infinitely better than starting with this and giving up before you even give your chance, give yourself a chance to explore what good watercolor works like. You can't beat these deals. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to, I'm going to try these and then I'm going to swatch these out and test out my beautiful brushes. I hope they work because, because I just really want them to work good. They came pretty highly recommended, but then so, so did some of the junky glue I've been purchasing. So I don't know if I trust that kind of stuff or not. So I'm going to go unwrap these and set this up and I will be back and we'll do some painting. I just got a real cool artsy digital kit the other day uh, for an artsy junk journal. And I think these little, I kept all of them, of course. I think these would make great additions to that artsy fartsy junk journal. So then pop off the cellophane. And they have the num the names right on. This is Chinese white, and it gives you the code number and all that jazz. But it's just a pan of color. And it, it just pops out like that. So this is the Chinese white. I have no use for this. I've never had any use for Chinese white on my palette. And then you just pop the pan back in. I have a little bit of play, and if that drives you bananas, I haven't used it yet, so I don't know if it will. But you can put just a little bit of, uh, we used to call it poster putty. I don't know. It's just like, it's kind of like a gum eraser. It's real gummy, and you warm it up in your hands, and then just stick, you, you use it to keep candles in candlesticks and posters on the wall without making holes, that kind of stuff. Tacky something or other. Just put a piece of that underneath and that would keep those in place. Now these these whole things seem to move around and I want to think that they would pop out for some reason. They do. Now why would that be? To replace them maybe? And why so much give? Maybe if you bought bigger pans, like if you wanted, these are, I think they're half pans. If you wanted full pans, maybe those would fit in here but then you'd only have six colors i don't know i have to do some research or figure that out because i'm home and i'm not traveling i'm not going to use the handy dandy little water things because uh, i have my water here and you know these get messy too this gets dirty really really fast because it's such a tiny bit of water but it's better than not having any when you're traveling. I mentioned in the other video that I wanted to show you that this is called the travel set, the Windsor Newton travel thing. Now remember, this is supposed to sit in here, but it's it's about almost twice the size. This one is a little bit taller, but it's it's quite a bit bigger. You know, if you do it this way, it's the same, almost the same height, but quite a bit wider. So this one, you know, if you really crunch for space, this is the better option. Just take an extra little glass with you or find one wherever you are. Any place you go, we'll have a Dixie cup to share with you. Or get one of those little pop-up travel cups and throw that in your kit. And not, you know, not have to worry about two of these or put two of those travel cups in and use those. 
So there's all kinds of options, but I wanted to show you the difference in size between these. I wanted to start with these so I don't forget. Now I've never used these myself, so it's all gonna be new to me. Oh, this is a piece of Mommy Gummy paper that I made the other night. And what is this, you ask? This is toilet paper. I pulled the core of the toilet paper out and squished it down so it'd be kind of flat. And I just, this is an old shirt. It's like um, thermal underwear, soft cotton, but it has, it has kind of a, a tooth to it, a grid to it. And that helps clean off your brushes. The toilet paper soaks up the moisture so you're not having to change your rag every five seconds. That sounds horrible to anyone who's ever been a 13 year old female. Without having to change this all the time, if you're at St. Vinny's or thrifting or whatever and you find old fashioned, super soft cotton thermal underwear, pick it up and make watercolor rags out of it. So nice. Oh, look what I did. Not paying attention. Was, while I'm ranting about water containers for watercolor, I've heard people say, oh, yeah, I've dipped my paintbrush in my coffee. <laughs> um, pardon me. That's just dumb. I would never, ever use a mug to watercolor with. I use these fine and dandy little Jif containers. I've never had coffee out of a container like this. I've never drank juice out of a peanut butter container. That will never happen here in this case because I don't cross pollinate stuff. Paint jars for painting, mugs for coffee. It's a simple fix. It's a simple fix. Anyway, so I sprayed I sprayed my colors here. Let's see what they're going to do. This is a print that I made on my non-laser print printer. And Mommy got me did. There's a million videos on how to do that. I'm not going to show you how to do that. I'm just going to... What I was hoping was that these beautiful metallics would... I don't know how I thought it was going to happen. That they'd be wet enough to get in there, but not wet enough to ruin the print. This is what happens when a non-laser print print gets wet. Now, there's, Janet Nash and I have talked about this. We get it screwed up a lot. There's Mommy Gami, which is this wadding of the paper and undoing of the paper and painting of the paper. And then there's Wabi Sabi, which is the, I think it's Chinese art of filling in the cracks when beautiful pottery is broken or glassware is broken. You fill in the pottery, the, cla the cracks with gold. And Wabi Sabi is the belief that the cracks say in our aged skin and our fine frown lines and laugh lines, those of us who have them, um, just make the piece or the person that much more beautiful. It shows a long life. It shows life experience. It shows all kinds of things. And by filling it in with gold, well, then it makes it all that much more valuable. And just because the pottery piece is cracked doesn't mean that it no longer has value. So I love, I love Wabi Sabi. And as Janet pointed out, I told her, I, I'm so excited. I finally got metallic watercolor paint. She said, oh, you'll be throwing it all over. And I'm sure she's right. So I'm just going to put a little bit on this paper to see what it would do if it uh, will move enough or everywhere I've put it is it gonna is it gonna bleed I was hoping that it would just go in the cracks what I want to work isn't working on this one like I'd hoped just dry brush it maybe kind of go over it maybe that won't 
disrupt the ink too badly. I'm using all the colors. I'm going to swatch it out here pretty quick. Quit screwing around. Ooh, but that's pretty. Let's flip it over and do the other side with the dry brush. So instead of going in the cracks where I kind of hoped it would, the dry brush is skipping over all the bumps, which is kind of fun. I want my brush super, super clean before I go into this nice, bright, white gold. I like to call it silver. <laughs> Let's try some on this side just to see what it's going to do. It's not very opaque, but it sure is shiny. It's more like an opalescent without all of the extra colors. Pearlescent, I guess, is a better, is the proper term. Pretty cool. Not exactly what I thought, but not bad at all. So can you see that little, little bit of gold glinting off those edges. I think that's wonderful. What color haven't we used yet? I don't think we've tried that one. By habit, I've gotten this brush really, really wet and then went into this paint. Well, I'm dry brushing. So what do I do? Wipe it off and start it over? That's a waste of paint. I'm going to take my paper. I usually have a box of Kleenex. Apparently it's out. Uh, and fold it up so that it's nice, you know, it's got a couple layers, it's nice and absorbent. And I'm gonna go to the belly of the brush toward the, the ferrule, and I'm gonna blot it. So that's gonna drain the water out and leave the paint in the brushes. I'm gonna do it on both sides just to make sure. I don't know if you can see, but this is nice and wet here now because I have taken the most of the water out of that brush so I can go ahead and dry brush without wasting that paint. I don't think we went into this one yet, this first one. They look very different, but so far on this multicolored thing, they all kind of look the same except for the white gold. That's not good or bad, that just is. I imagine it'll be different on something else. So that is a fun look. I love how that looks. I think I would do each page in a different different kind of gold. This one I might try the white gold on. Again, I'm just gonna take it, take that belly of the brush and bend it just a little bit, just to blot out that water. And then I can dry brush. It's very light, this white gold. But it sure is pretty when, when you can see it. Got to do something there. That's pretty, pretty homely. Mm, this one looks to be about the darkest. I guess we'll. And this is not watercolor paper for the life of me. I have no idea where I got this or what it is from, but it is sure nice and heavy. one. So I can see why this is called a red gold. It's very warm. A lot of red in it for sure. I want to go back and see what just a light wash will do. I'm anxious to see what this will do on watercolor paper. Just sort of adds some sparkle if not a lot of color. That, that glitter just sits on, sits, it just floats in that water. It's very pretty. The water here and the water here. I need a new eight. I thought I got a new eight 
And I ended up with two sixes. I wonder if I got a new eight. Because, uh, well, I have two eights. They're different kind. Because this one, I don't know if you can see it, but it's all frayed because I have used the bejesus out of it. It's just like rubbing it over watercolor paper over and over and over again for all these years. It's kind of like running it over a fingernail file, essentially. It, it wears, wears the brushes out. They don't last forever. Go figure. I like these. These are nice and creamy. Uh, they go on really nicely. So on this black, they are looking very different. On my mommy got me paper, they looked all the same. Quite a bit of difference once they're all done. This is drying nicely. I love that white on that purplish black gray, whatever color that is. And this turned out really cool, except for my wet spot, but I'll just put something over it. It'll be fine. Okay, I'm going to dump this out, even though it's dirty water. I don't want all that mica. Can you see how beautiful that is? I don't know, maybe you can't see it on camera. All that beautiful mica floating around in there. I'm going to change out both my waters because I don't want that interfering with this. So we're going to put the gold away for right now. And we're going to go wash these out really good. And wipe them out. Because mica is like dust. It stays forever. I also try to keep my dirty water one always the dirty water one. Sometimes I even mark it. I don't know. Just because dirty is dirty. I want to keep it not dirty. But one of the things I really don't particularly like about pan watercolor is they take longer to reconstitute tube watercolor you have to reconstitute too because it dries out but it doesn't take as long to me it just these have to sit a while to get reconstituted give them a good spray we're gonna try this Windsor and Newton student grade paper 25% cotton acid free at least there's some cotton in it. Watercolor paper is so expensive because it's 100% cotton. That's the difference between wood, pulp, and cotton fabric. Think of how differently those things behave. Paper, regular, cheap, even though they call it watercolor paper, if it's doesn't have any cotton in it it's wood pulp it's paper versus this has some cotton in it why does that matter because the watercolor paper made with 100 percent cotton is specifically formulated to make watercolor do its thing one of the reasons we love watercolor is the movement and how it it bleeds into each other and the water makes it move and dance and sometimes the blossoms are just magical. That's one of the things we love about watercolor. And while it will do some of that on cheaper paper, it, it can't behave the way it's meant to on crappy paper. And so we're going to try this student grade. I've, I've never had a paper that was part cotton. It was either 100% cotton or wood pulp. I never had anything in between. So this is all going to be new to me. It does have a bit of a tooth. And there is a bit of a front and a back. Like the front, the divots go down. And the back, the divots are up. Just like when you emboss something and you and you run it through your embosser and it forces that paper into a mold. This side, the gullies go down and this side, the gullies go up. So we're using the, well, I was going to say we're using the back of that one, but because I've already got a sketch on the front of that one and, but we'll use the front of this one. I was just going to use the back of something, but we'll use the front of this and we will get to swatching. Now, lemon yellow, this is what the Cotman kit comes with. Lemon yellow, 
which is a cool, cool yellow. Oh yeah. A cadmium yellow, which is in this case, a warm yellow. Permanent rose is the cool red and the warm red is cadmium cadmium pale hue practically an orange cool blue is ultramarine warmer blue and this palette is cerulean blue hue now when your colors say hue it only means in their name on the tag it means that either to make it truly cerulean blue is too expensive because of whatever pigment is necessary or sometimes they find the pigments dangerous like zinc white was a problem for a while was it zinc white or titanium white one of them was cancerous you know so they had to stop making it and so they make the hue which is chemically different but as close to the color as possible and that is on this palette the warmer of the two blues then we have viridian again viridian hue and sap green sap green has a and by warm and cool one is a warmer version of that color this is a cooler red than a warmer red a cooler blue than a warmer blue meaning this blue has a lot more yellow in it this blue has a lot more red in it this blue leans to the cool side of the scale and this one leans to the warm side of the scale and sometimes if you have a different blue than french ultra than ultramarine this isn't french ultra it's just ultra um if you have a different blue, this one might be the cooler of the two. So on this palette, these are the warms and cools of each color. And earlier I said a warm, an orange, and a brown. And what I should have said was a cool brown and a warm brown, burnt umber, and burnt sienna. If all of this is all, as clear as mud to you, I am putting together, finally, finally, my Get to Know Your Palette Watercolor Class workshop. This will be a paid workshop on Patreon. More details on that to come. But the whole idea is because I've never seen anyone teach you how to use your palette, whatever your palette happens to be. Because a lot of times we pick up all oh, this, these colors from this book and these colors from that book and this girl used it on this video and I really liked it. And so now you've got this mishmash. You don't know what is warm or cool. You don't know which is what. You don't know what they make together. You just have this palette that sometimes works for you and sometimes doesn't. Well, get to know your palette. My workshop and forthcoming book is about all about how to teach you how to use the colors you have. What I love about this kit and the other field kit is that if you're just starting at ground zero or you want a fresh start, these already come with the colors that I would suggest, a warm and cool of each of the primaries. Yellow is a primary, red is a primary, blue is a primary. And you have a warm and cool of each, then you get the extra bonus of the greens and the browns. If you didn't have the greens and the browns, you could make all of the other colors with just these three or six, as it were. If you don't have any of that and you can't afford to get this super good deal right now, you can only buy three, buy a red, a blue, and a, and a yellow that are neutral. Not too warm, not too cool. More on that in the class. But this is a fantastic starter kit to teach you about color mixing. And I'm going to use this kit to do that workshop. So if you're looking to do that workshop when it eventually gets here, this kit or the other field kit, they have about the same colors, uh, will do you very well. Been a while since I used pan watercolors, so bear with me here. I have had these soaking now for a little bit. I like to use a wet brush. I also like to put down some water on my paper to check and see is it a 
Is it going to flow well? What's it going to do? First thing I'm going to do is take some creamy paint. So I'm, this this nice juicy layer off the top and I'm going to put it where the water isn't. Uh, let's see, underneath here. I'm going to put it where the water isn't because I don't want this first one. I just want a nice swatch of that color. Mostly pigment, not a lot of water. And I'm going to go up in here and put it in that water and add some water and see if it's going to bleed out. Maybe feather it out a little bit add just more and more water to see how light I can get it. So nice to be using Windsor & Newton again. I bought all new Holbein colors and I'm looking to get up back into, not that there's anything wrong with it, I just prefer Windsor and Newton. I don't know if it's because it's what I've always used. So this is my second color and I'm already not liking that they move around. So the next time you see this palette, I will have put poster putty underneath each one of those so that it doesn't move around because that would drive me bonkers. So I'm going to do another swatch here and I should have, you know, drawn this out and made a little graph. I've seen people make little holders for their for their swatches and I'm just sort of winging it, which I do most often. I'm just playing around. I want to see how they move. So that's a nice dry mostly pigment, nice bright cadmium. And then I'm going to I'm going to take a different brush and just fill it with water so I don't waste the little bit of paint that's on here. I'm just going to put some water down. And I never, 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 never put my soap. Just, I see people do this all the time too, just drop their brushes. That will ruin your brushes so much faster than if you t don't ever get in the habit of doing that. So I did lay some water down. I'm going to just put that cadmium in. Now this cadmium moves around quite a bit more than the lemon yellow did. Which is good to know. I'll take that cadmium and I'm just going to feather it out a little bit. And in my class I teach all about tints and hues and colors and oh what's the difference and who cares what does it matter I just want to paint rocks for fuck's sake it all matters and the more you understand what your what's going on with your paints and why the easier it is for you to understand how it is to control it and that's what watercolor is all about control oh yeah that would drive me bananas so what I did too is I when I unwrapped them and put them all back. I put cool, warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, cool, warm. You want to get your palette so that you don't even have to look at it eventually. my Before I got a new palette, I didn't even really have to look. I put it in the same place all the time. I knew my colors backwards, forwards, inside and out. And I didn't have to think about that. Just like, again, the driving analogy. I don't want to have to think, oh, wait, does the lemon yellow, does that make it yellow or muddy? Or is it the cadmium? It, is the cadmium the one that, that bleeds really well? Or is it the lemon? If you play around with it enough, you know all those things and it's second nature to you. You don't have to think about it. So now I'm in with the permanent rose. And I'm just going to do permanent rows under here. And this is a really a pinky pink on the pink side of red. Um, I won't go as far as to call it a magenta at all, uh, but it is a cool red. There are cooler reds, like alizarin crimson is a beautiful cool red. My 
And again, all these little exercises help you understand what's wet, what's too wet, what's too dry, what's too much, what's not enough. You want to let the water soak in just a little bit. In cotton papers, there's sizing in it, and I always like to work up that sizing into kind of a froth on the top, and it just makes the water color do its magic. So I'm going to go back into that top creamy and, and uh, put that in here. Is it going to bleed a lot? Is it going to move? Oh, I just spat it all over the place. It moves a little bit. I like the brightness of this paper. It's pretty bright white. It's not 100% bright white, but it's nice. Oh, it feels so good to paint with real paint again. I don't know why. I just not at all happy with the whole bind. So in my view, this is straight up orange. This is this is more than a warm red. This is an orange color. But for our purposes, we can call it a uh, super warm red. <laughs> But can you see, you might not be able to see it, the difference in the in the yellows, because there's half the color wheel that's warm and half the color wheel that's cool. Blues, greens, and violets, cool. Grass, sky, cool. Fire, sunshine, cool and warm. That's easy to see. But if you have yellow, which is on the warm side of the color wheel, how can they, how can one be warm and one be cool? Aren't they both warm? Well, no. This has, a, this leans a lot more to the cool side of things. This has a lot more red in it, a lot more orange in it. It's warmer feeling than this. What I'm doing here is making tints. How light can I get it? The lightest version, a whisper of a color. Some go longer. Like, there's not a lot of difference in this lemon yellow. This, quite a bit further. This kind of wears out pretty quick. Ooh, that's a nice mover. That moves quite a bit. You need to know that because if you're putting this into something else, this will take over. If you're working wet into wet, this will push other colors out of its way. It's important to know these things. I should have a book of unwasted paint open so that I'm not wasting paint, but I don't. Ultra, French ultramarine blue is one of my favorite colors ever. I just love French ultra. This is a little bit lighter. French ultra is deeper. The uh, professional artist quality is a little bit deeper in that it almost goes to the purple side. Not quite, but. So I want to start out with pure pigment, meaning almost right out of the pan. There's barely any water there. And then I want to as many different tints as I can. Tint. Think hint of color. So this blossom's nice, but it doesn't travel. Like this travels. This will take over everything. This blossom's nice, but doesn't travel. So we're going to take this down. This blue has quite a bit of yellow in it. Not enough to make it turn green, but it's very warm. I love cerulean blue for skies. So I did quite a bit of painting while my phone was off, oh, uh... but I finished swatching out, talking to you the whole time. Yes, thinking my 
camera was rolling the whole time for about 30 minutes. I swatched the rest of these out and gave you all kinds of watercolor tips and hints and lessons and a few rants, you know, all that wonderful stuff. Uh, all to myself, gone, never to be heard by you. <laughs> so here's the swatch colors. Here's all the colors swatched out, our two browns, our cool green and warm green. I've had other palettes where this is the warm green and I've had cooler greens uh, but in this palette in this setup this is obviously the cooler green meaning there's far more yellow in this there's far more blue in this warmer cooler and I said when I showed you this before I took the the uh, wrapping wrappers off that I had a brown and an orange well it's burnt sienna and burnt umber two browns technically this is cadmium red hue i think is what they're calling this yeah they're calling this cadmium red pale hue and for my money it's orange that's what this is but in this palette it's the warm version of red so we have a cool version of each of the primaries and a warm version of each of the primaries much more yellow warm in this how do you have if if the color wheel is half warm and half cool how do you have yellow is a warm color fire sunshine heat etc so how is yellow cool well it leans more to the blue side than the yellow side really important to train your eye to see yellow because if you can see yellow in this red and if you can see yellow warm in this blue and yellow in this green you'll 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 be able to avoid getting mud and why did i take the black out because when you use a burnt umber and an ultramarine they make a really nice dark that reads black but it has a lot more life to it that's why I took the black out. So I'm going to fill those little. But this, this, and the artist quality of the Burnt Umber and the artist quality of the French Ultra. This is just Ultra. I think the artist quality is called French Ultra. It's way deeper, deeper, deeper on both of them. Here, this is like a milk chocolate. And the Burnt Umber in the artist quality is more of a dark chocolate color. Um, this paper, again, is the Windsor Newton student grade, 25% cotton, cold press. It's okay. It swatched out the colors okay in that I can see what colors they are. It's a decent level of white in that it's not too creamy. There's not a big difference between bright white copy paper in this, so it's a nice bright color versus this watercolor paper you see how creamy this is a lot more yellow in this paper and in transparent watercolor that matters this is going to be a very different look this having a base this is like snow white white snow white white not quite and this is creamy colored it makes a difference it makes a difference so if you can spot yellow in things, I have a video on that coming out. And I actually, I think that's part of the workshop, the Get to Know Your Palette workshop that talks about training your eye to see yellow. This one is, is creamier. You can see the difference, brighter white, creamier, but this one, look how much better the colors lay, for lack of a better word. How much better those colors lay. Even this muddy spot where I have two complementary colors, a blue and an orange, those are complementary colors. They neutralize each other out. They're not going to make black. They're just going to make a neutral, probably a brown, versus this. I tried to do about the same Thing. I went, I don't know why I did one sideways and one, one portrait, but that's how it worked out. So 
I tried to do the very same thing. And you can see, at least I hope you can see, let me see if I can zoom in just a little bit. I hope that you can see how much better behaved the watercolor is on this 100% cotton paper. Now this is Meaden. It's not Arches, which is my favorite, my all-time favorite. If I can find bright white Arches, 140 pound cold press paper, I am in hog heaven. I like the bright, bright white because I think it makes a big difference in the brightness of the overall painting. But you can see See how they, this is me putting what, wet into what's almost dry and you get these, these blooms or blossoms. Some people hate them. I quite like them. I think, I think that's part of what makes watercolor wonderful. See how, how, how softly it just fades out. And here it's very clunky. Like things don't fade into each other or out of each other. It just stops. One thing I really don't like is how toothy it is. It makes almost all the colors look granulated and they're not, they're, they're not. Viridian, I think it is sort of granular color, not according to the label or according to this handy dandy little chart, which is why we make our own chart because experience tells different. Even this, this muddy spot kind of glows where this just muddied out, right? So I'm not looking forward to doing paintings on this. I do have one sketched out here that I'm going to do. Uh, so we'll see. Beauty of this one I'm kind of having to bend because, you know, there's so much water and I didn't tape it down. I never do. But that's the beauty of working on a block. There's no buckling here. If it does buckle as it dries, it dries it flat out because it's, it's surrounded by gum. It's gummed on all four sides. And so it lays nice. It dries nice and flat. Um, certainly a better alternative this Meaden is not too badly priced. It's a cheaper alternative to the Arches. The Arches is really the industry standard. I worked with artists from all over the country, and they all use Arches. Uh, we've all experimented over the years, for sure, just like this. I'm going to use this. I'm going to love up this watercolor block. I'm going to love up this pad. I'm going to do color swatching and experiments and whatnot. Uh, I'm going to use it. But I prefer the arches. So now we know what the colors look like and how they behave. And we've swatched them out. Now we know. These are our trimies. This was fun. This was great. I can't wait. Look how metallic. I mean, that's super shiny. That is so fun. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to playing with all these and making, making art with that instead of, you know, making these things but I am also quite looking forward to doing the color trials for the get to know your palette workshop that is coming hopefully by spring I will have it rocking ready to go for you after many years um, it's been many years you know what I did try I cannot believe it what why didn't anybody say anything the whole point was to try these oi I have to try these in another video. This one is way longer than I wanted it to be. I cannot believe I totally spaced. Totally spaced. Wow. Care? I worry about you. All right. That's enough for one time. If you're still here, then you are. You're a brave soul. <laughs> I appreciate your time. And obviously you're interested in watercolor. So watch for the Get to Know Your Palette workshop coming soon to my Patreon. Until we meet again, have a lovely crafty day. Go love up your beast, please. My take at the lake, out of her mind.